You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Here's the thing, guys. If you're into fantasy football, DraftKings.com is the mother of all fantasy football websites. Now, I haven't done a survey. I don't have empirical evidence of that. But I'm telling you right now, it's not only the mother. It's, well, the king of all (laughs) fantasy football websites. DraftKings.com. One-way fantasy means no season-long commitments. You play whenever you want. If you got an injured player, it's not a problem. It's like a new season every week, so you're never stuck with the same players. You pick your team in minutes, and you could be on your way to winning instant cash. Hurry and get free entry into the $100,000, I'll say it again, $100,000 fantasy football contest this weekend where first place takes home, hold, ten grand, 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 grand. Whoa, that was a, an echo. Head to DraftKings.com now and enter uh, code Callen. That's my last name, C-A-L-L-E-N, the host of the mother of all podcasts. Uh, and you get to play for free if you do that. So go to DraftKings.com, enter code Callen, C-A-L-L-E-N, and you get to play for free. DraftKings.com, bigger events, bigger winnings, bigger millionaires. And not that they're heavier, just they're bigger somehow. Enter calendar for free entry now at DraftKings.com. I said it again, DraftKings.com. And now, back to the podcast. <laughs> Jeez, oh, yeah. The man doesn't play around. Ladies and gentlemen, the author of perhaps, I don't know, maybe the most important book ever written, and I don't ever use the word ever. Uh, <laughs> Michael Mouse has written the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il, uh, and they call him a celebrity ghostwriter, etc. But uh, a great writer. A and very the official funny, very good title book. is "Dear Reader." That's right, because it, this was written in. You know, listen. I mean, as far as you're concerned, Kim Jong Il actually wrote this, and you were just the ghostwriter. You writer. just channeled. Him. You were. You were he, in the. You he, were in the room. He, he dictated it to me. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. As dictators are want to do. As dictators are want to do. You're so gutsy, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this was this is this is amazing. He is a fascinating character. His son has been missing for the past month. Uh what a bunch of shitheads these guys are. <laughs> uh, yes. God, they're the worst. I mean, just the worst. They look terrible. They're just terrible in general. Uh why <laughs> I can't wait yes. to get into this. Um how much of this book is true? I think you went to Korea. Didn't you go Yeah. I, I, I went to North Korea and I got all the propaganda and I got and I read all the Western books and I adapted it to the story of his life. So how much of it's true? Well, how much is any celebrity book true, right? Exactly. Uh, if, you, if you read Hillary Clinton's book, uh, you have to use the same kind of uh, rule of thumb. But the point, what, what I did when I wrote The Reader is, when you're done with the book, you're going to have an understanding of how North Korea got to be where they are today, their perspective and their history. Because uh, everyone knows Kim Jong-il and no one really knows what the hell's going on there. So I kind of wanted to have a book where people could figure that out while kind of enjoying themselves, enjoying the story. Yeah, they've done a remarkable job of really being that hermit kingdom. Korea was always considered a hermit kingdom from what I've read. But man, oh man, uh, I mean, Jesus, they they are just, they can't feed their own people. It just goes on and on. But apparently he's an amazing golfer, and that's the good news, or was an amazing golfer. <laughs> I, mean, I can't believe it. I think he got 13 holes in one uh, his first time out and then just was like, you know what? I got this. I'm not going to play anymore. Well, well, that's the least of his abilities. One of the, my favorite stories that's in the book, which is true, is that he can claim to sh- he claims to sh- be able to shrink time. And the story goes, it's, but he can do it. Listen, this is how he does it. He's sitting at a conference and someone's giving a speech and he's working on papers and his aides are coming to ask him for questions. And as he's working on these papers, the speaker keeps stopping. And Kim Jong-il goes, why are you not speaking? And the guy goes, well, you're working on those papers, they're interrupting you. And he goes, I can do all these things at once. And according to literature, that meant from that point on, Kim Jong-il was regarded as being able to shrink time because he didn't look at time as a plane, but as a cube. And my friend goes, does he mean multitasking? (laughs) Yes, that's literally what he means. And apparently he's the only person in North Korea capable of doing more than one thing at once. So it's a good thing he's in the leadership position, huh? Uh, Amazing, man. Do we really know anything about what it's like, what it would be like to work for the guy? I mean, was he a ruthless, was he, he wasn't sadistic. He wasn't a sadistic sociopath. He just sounds like he was 
crazy. <laughs> he, well, no, no. He was absolutely a sadistic sociopath. He was not crazy at all. In fact, uh, we know a lot about it because so many high-level people fled the country because even if you're at the very top, you still have that sort of Damocles over your head, and you could be executed any minute. So mm. no matter how good life is for you, if you're wondering if you and your family are going to be killed, look at Kim Jong-un's uncle, you're going to get out of Dodge and better live a peaceful life in South Korea. Yeah, they, said, they very- said his uncle was, uh, the, I think they set hounds on him, or they opened up a bunch of artillery on him. How did they it, kill his uncle? It, it, was, it was the artillery. that they're, they're not going to waste you know, dogs. They don't have that many dogs to go around. I'm not right. even kidding. Of course. Uh, in fact, during the famine, there's a secret recording of Kim Jong-il, when the people were starving and the kids were starving in the street, up to 10% of the population starved, and he's complaining that there's two Korean breeds of dogs that are being driven to extinction, and how is it that the people don't care about these Korean dogs that we have to preserve? So talk about sociopath. That, that's where his priorities were. Amazing. But uh, the, the other thing that I thought was so fascinating, what you capture in the book, is there's always this mythologization, cult of personality stories that they create of the person's childhood, of their like yes. early career, those signs of like almost the Jesus like early signs of greatness, like oh he turned water into wine and then he did this and then he did this. Oh yeah, a new star appeared over the sky over Mount Pic. To be very explicitly borrowed from the Christian mythology, uh, they have a trinity, which is Kim Jong Il is the Jesus figure, his father, the founder of North Korea, Kim Il Sung is the Holy Father, and Kim Jong Il's mother, anti Japanese heroine Kim Jong Suk is kind of their Virgin Mary. So, and that's, that's what gives Kim Jong-un the right to lead. It's very odd that a young man in his 30s would be leading a country that's so focused on age and, and respect for the elderly, mm. but it's because he has the blood of Mount Pic II in his veins that is a divine right, which is also odd in an atheist country, but they very much speak of the blessings of heaven uh, being given to this family. Well, he's, he's considered a god. I mean, the Korea, one of the things they say about North Korea and the North Korean population is changing now, but is don't underestimate how religious they are and in terms of how they rev- they revered the dear leader Kim Jong Il uh, uh, as a, a real god right and even well, more it, so it, his father right yeah. oh yeah so all the refugees who have escaped despised Kim Jong Il his father Kim Il Sung supposedly drove the, the wicked Jap devils out of North Korea during World War II and then defeated, supposedly, the U.S. imperialist in the Korean War. And he led North Korea for around 50 years. Mm. When Kim Jong-il took over, he had nothing, no credits to his name, certainly no war leadership. So they had to make up all these stories to show that the son was equal to the father. But when Kim Jong-il took over is when the famine hit. So either he allowed it to happen or was helped to prevent it. So they despise Kim Jong-il uh, in North Korea, and they still revere his father, Kim Il-sung. Wow, man. Well, you know, I've heard from the experts that say, first of all, I can't believe he's never been assa- he wasn't assassinated, but they say that Cur- the North Korea is going to collapse from within. Do you, do you have that sense in about seven years or so? Uh, they've been saying that in 94, when Kim Jong-il took over, I have him in, his bo- in the book gloating, yeah. because all the Westerners are like, are they going to collapse? They're going to collapse? They're going to collapse? And he died in office. You know, for a country that's regarded as crazy, all these other Soviet uh, uh, countries collapsed, and they're the only ones standing. So obviously they can't be that crazy or suicidal if they're doing something right. And what they're doing is they're perfectly willing to have 10% of the population starve in order to have the regime maintain its hold and power. They're perfectly willing to have concentration camps where they send your whole family uh, to make sure no one speaks out against them. Yeah, they do that, don't they? They imprison the entire family. Yeah, so the great leader Kim Il-sung said, class enemies must be exterminated, that's the word, exterminated to three generations. So even under Stalin, uh, and even under Hitler, you had these trials where people were tortured and forced to confess. There's this pretense of legality. North Korea doesn't have that. What North Korea does is, someone comes to your house in the middle of the night, uh, the police, and they round up your whole family and they send you all to the camps, three generations, and the thing is, you don't know which one of you got you sent to the camp mm. because you're not told your sentence. You're just told, come with me. You don't ask questions. And people are just vanished. Jesus Christ. And that's always, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, what you're talking about there is something that you see as a repeated theme is that, you know, turning people against each other, right? The closest people. I mean, the French used to do this thing when they were trying to consolidate language and they would make people wear a sign saying, I speak Provençal or whatever local language. Right. And then what would happen is, is that, you know, like, like the kid who was caught speaking the local language would wear that. And he would have to catch another kid in school speaking that local language. And when they did, then they had to wear the sign. And whoever was stuck wearing the sign at the end of the day would be beaten. 
And oh. so what it does is it, and you know, the, 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 I believe the British did the same thing with Welsh, but what it does is it means that, you know, everybody in the community views each other as an enemy. Oh, um, oh well, it, it's very explicit and, and encouraged in that regard. You know, people in the West think that North Korea is just crazy because they revere the leaders. Let me show, let me explain a little bit more, and I talk about this, of course, in the book, just how pervasive the oppression is. Everyone in the country, literally everyone, is slotted in some group. The women's workers, your school, you know, your union. And once a week, everyone, everyone in the country has to get up in front of that group and say, this is what I did wrong this week. I was late to school. I messed up my homework. Then your colleagues have to get up in front of your other colleagues and say what they saw you doing wrong. So Damn, everyone, for 40 years, this has been going on every week for everyone in the country. It's, uh, ma- it's madness. That's the thing it, about that. Like, you realize it's, that's why the book is so... It, it, it's, it, it's, it'd be like a lot of the stuff that you're... You can't believe that this is actually what the Korean people are being fed. It's madness. It's truly madness. It's absolutely madness. It's the worst place on earth. And it, what's really fun for me, and I'm glad you guys... Uh, and I'm not surprised that you guys get it right away. But a lot of times I'll have interviews where I'll have some kind of like vapid morning TV show and they're like all giggling and laughing. And then within like two minutes, I have them on the verge of tears because I think most Americans appreciate that it's bad. But once they start thinking about what that actually means in practice, they realize there's nothing funny about this place whatsoever. Uh, no. It's just really the worst place on earth. And that's but the thing is, I had to make the book funny because people can't wrap their heads around this stuff when it's written with a face value. I wanted to make it entertaining so you can learn, but at the same time you're like, holy crap, this is, this is no joke. Well, that's why, well, that's why, it's, that's why it's important, because you, you realize that what, what totalitarian regimes are really about. And what's interesting as well, and what I thought you did a really good job of in the book, is, is that you do such a good job of sort of slow rolling it, where you start off and, you know, it's sort of like, oh, this is sort of nice, right? We're on Mount Peck 2, like, you know, we're fighting the Japanese, and then you're starting to throw in Jap devils and a few little things like that. And then the stories get crazier and crazier and crazier so that we're really entering into the insanity. But we're not. Yeah. Well, the this edifice that the Kim family has constructed over North Korea did not happen overnight. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not like this nation woke up and all of a sudden there's oppression. They spent years building this huge bureaucracy of complete control over an entire country. And and what was surprising to me is when I started doing research for the book, you know, I thought I'd have to do a lot of reading between the lines. They gloat, you know, just like in The Incredibles, like every supervillain gloats. They (laughs) gloat about what they did. They gloat about the fact that every Every single person in North Korea thinks with one mind, the mind of the great leader. They, re- they refer to it as their monolithic ideological system. They think this is a wonderful thing that no one thinks of themselves. They think it's wonderful that people don't have spare time because spare time leads to liberalism and selfishness. So, it, and they think it's great that people are vanished because it provides for a peaceful nation. So rather than me having to kind of dig between the lines, I could quote them quite liberally uh, because they think this is the best thing ever and they've got it right and everyone else in the world has got it wrong. Um, what, when you think about this stuff, and I've read a lot about what we know about those prison camps. It's just, you know, they live on cornmeal and salt, I think. It's um, that, yeah. Yeah, and and um, it, it goes on and on. You can imagine the kind of sadism that goes on. What happens? You can't imagine it. I'm, I don't agree. You're I don't right. agree that any of us can have any kind of a concept of what that's like. You're right, not to mention the fact that you probably have children there, right? What do they oh, do? Oh, you definitely, of course you have children there. Yeah, they have to go to school. And the children rat on their parents. Like, they turn oh, their yeah. kids around against their parents the whole time. That was the, oh, Soviet, that was and- the old Soviet Union, too. Uh, well, they, but it's not like that, because when the kids rat on the parents in the Soviet Union, it may, especially after Stalin, it's not rewarded. like they got sent yeah. to the gulag. Yeah. Well, it, the parents were executed in front of them. Oh, you know, geez. they might have gotten a, some kind of punishment, but it, it's certainly not like this. I mean, in North Korea, once you're in the camp, there's punishments within the camp, such as you get sent into the mines, and you literally never leave the mines, and your skin falls off because of vitamin D deficiency. This is what they do with the men. And, and they, they gloat that women are, are treacherous, so they use the women in the camps as spies to seduce men and then when the women turn those men in those women are rewarded jesus christ so the men just stay in the mines they stay down in the mines they don't come out correct they will never see sunlight again literally oh my god it's a living hell 
It's a something. living hell. It's it, and I, I gotta say, on some level, and it, maybe this is weird to say, but you, you almost have to uh, respect the the creativity of the sadism because this is something that if I think if the three of us sat down and wanted to be creative on how can we corrupt human nature, I don't think we'd ever think of anything like this. No, well, I but either. I think that's the thing. I mean, that also comes down to what you were saying earlier: is is that this was not something that was built. Like, I don't think that Kim Il Sung you know, when he's first fighting the Japanese, could have imagined this system. Like, the family had to go down this rabbit hole of craziness for 50 years in order to get to the place where they could be that messed up. Well, the point is, I also want... I, it's not even that crazy because it's worked for them. Yeah, so exactly. It, it's, it's, oh, I would call it like an amoral efficiency because mm-hmm. it's, it's worked phenomenally for them. Well, it's, right. a, mo- it's a monarchy. It, this is a monarchy, isn't it? Yes, an absolute dictator- dictatorial monarchy. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, and in fact, this is what else is funny. Uh, you know, when Kim Jong-il was officially announced as a successor in 1980, of course, all the communist nations recoiled in horror because the idea that your son would succeed you under mm-hmm. communism is... Is complete anathema. I mean, communism is based on everyone's equal so on and so forth. And they have a beautiful rationalization for this. They address all their criticism head on, which is, look, when Khrushchev took over for Stalin in the 50s, the Soviet empire went to hell. So you have to have someone who's going to be as loyal as possible. And who is more loyal than someone's son? So mm-hmm. even in the context of communism, they have their rationalizations for everything that they do. Well, and that's one of the interesting things in the book, too, is is that through the eyes of Kim Jong-il, like how great Stalin was and what a monster oh, yes. Khrushchev was. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, Khrushchev turned his back on the revolution. And, and, and of course, he's got a few kind of words to say about Gorbachev, uh, obviously, you know, mm-hmm. and... So for them, the collapse of the Soviet empire was like the worst thing ever, of course. Mm-hmm. I mean, people being able to vote, watch television, you know, buy whatever clothes they wanted. My God, mm-hmm. what a nightmare. You, you've done a lot of, you, I mean, you, you, you took, did a lot of research for the book, but how much has, have, how much do we know of what Kim Jong-il actually said? He was so reticent. He was so quiet. Reticent, well, I think, is well, the I, word. I, I like to well, say reticent. I, <laughs> so I, that you, I, I would disagree with you, because is there any doubt what Kim Jong-il thought about movies, the art? He loved yeah. it. He loved them. Well, he also wrote extensive treatises about all these things, and everyone in North Korea has to follow the lead of these treatises. So when he writes the book on the art of the cinema, all movies have to be made in accordance with what he decreed as good art. So he spoke very well. He didn't speak. Well, there, there was no the, yeah, no metaphor. Apparently, was uh, any anything that you had to kind of look at and kind of interpret was bad art. It had to be pretty oh, on the nose. He, yeah, there's this great story in their literature, which is in the book, which is Kim jong Il's in high school, and this lecturer comes, and the lecturer is speaking about the Mona Lisa and how it's great art, and Kim jong Il gets up and yells at him and says, this is not good art. And I asked my mother, you know, I was born in the Soviet Union, I asked her, why does Kim jong Il hate the Mona Lisa? And she paused for a second, she goes, because it's ambiguous, and that's exactly correct. Wow. Good art has to have a very clear message for all the viewers, and since the Mona Lisa has a cryptic smile, by definition, it's not good art. Well, that's interesting. So you're, you're, you were born within the Soviet Union, so this obviously yeah. has personal resonance for you as well. Oh, yes. I mean, being Jewish, being born in the Soviet Union, these were two chances for me to uh, be sent to some kind of camp. You mean, uh, you mean the Jews didn't fare well in the Soviet Union? <laughs> 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 crazy talk. You mean, you're, if you tell me that they were kept in pails and ghettos, I'm going to flip out on you. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I just blew the interview, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, I'm the real crazy person yeah, here. Yeah, this is outrageous. This is Jewish paranoia at its paramount. This is bullshit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just so, because pogrom is a is a is a Russian word. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> God. You, you know, when I went there, when I, when I was a kid, when we first came to the States, my mom every weekend used to take us to these like discount clothing stores, and she was a shopaholic. And it drove me crazy. I resented I was bored out of my mind. But when I went to North Korea and I was talking to my guide, first of all, you know, they have everything they have there is very dated. So she had the same like 1980s haircut that my mom had when we came over. And as I was talking to her and, and seeing what her life is what, like, it really made me kind of feel an enormous sense of retroactive empathy for my mom. Mm -hmm. Because if you grow up where you can never buy a nice dress or you can never buy makeup 
or, and everything is shabby and dirty and gross for no reason whatsoever, of course you're going to get a complex about it. And that really kind of clicked in my head and, and made me kind of more grateful to, for my family to help me escape the Soviet Union. Amazing, man. If you guys and, have and just we- not killed Christ. Now, uh, <laughs> oh, hold on. Sorry, Michael. Sorry. He came back. Sorry. He, came he back. did he come back. Here. Michael, he did so- come back. You're right. So you know what? So, God damn those Jew bashers, those bastards. He, he came back. He's and, the Jew bastard. And, I know. And he, and, and he was a, and he, I was saying Jew bashers, not Jew bastard. I said oh. Jew bashers. <laughs> Jesus, Michael. Uh, easy. There's that Jewish paranoia again. He, and, he was, and, and he was a rabbi. So he was Jewish himself, for God's sake. Yeah. Yes. No, no, it's true, though. It's, it's, you, you do have a very different perspective when, when you, the, you know, the pogrom really is a, the, every time that the czar or something would go wrong, they would be like, let's blame the Jews, yeah. you know, yeah. and they'd go in there and, yeah, so, so and, and, and it was a great, you know, a rabbi was, there were a lot of stories of rabbis, you know, as the synagogue was burned around him and he's being kicked to death, he was still clutching the Torah, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, so, it, I mean, we, we obviously weren't observant in the Soviet Union, but it, it, this is why I kind of did this, this book, because I thought it was really tragic that there's no books out there where if people want to inform themselves about North Korea in a kind of entertaining way, that they have the capacity to do so. All you can do is read these college texts, which are so dense, or you can read these super, super depressing books, uh, which is hard for people to take because there's not that much that we can do. So I'm like, there's got to be some kind of lighthearted take I can do, on, which is a very Jewish gallows sense of humor. God bless uh, you, though. Uh, God, uh, that, that's exactly how you get to people, though. You know, yes. you write a really entertaining book like this, and and it permeates. It permeates. If you write an academic book or you talk about how bad it is, you're right. The Gulag Archipelago is a great book by Solzhenitsyn, but you know, not a lot of people are going to slog through it, whereas this is... Right. Well, and that's yeah. the other thing, too, is I mean, I think it prepares you for those books. I mean, we had uh, the author of Bloodlands on, and that's an amazing book, but boy, is it draining. Like, it's emotionally yeah. draining because it's just such an assault, and you need to be prepared for that. And I think that's the thing, is, is that once you read Dear Reader... Then, you know, we, and you start to understand what this stuff is about, then you can understand why it's so important to read things like Bloodlands and the Gulag Archipelago. But, but, but Michael, also, you know, th- look, this is a, an egregious human rights crisis on a massive scale. I don't know what the population of North Korea is. 24 million. 24 million. I yeah. mean, if... And I know that they've got a crazy arsenal pointed directly at South Korea, not to mention, I think, a dam that they could release water and flood the entire country. And the fact that Seoul is within spitting distance of the DMZ, which is so much of the problem. Exactly. So, 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 you know, obviously, if there was ever a case for invading a country and taking out a regime... You know, we saw how well that went in Iraq, so let's be careful. But I'm just saying that, you know, you can see that... There's this need, that just from a human humanitarian perspective, to do something about this. What well, do we well, do about morally, it? Morally, morally, yes. Ethic, uh, practically, I don't know if that's the case. Yeah. There's, there's up to there's two hundred to three hundred thousand people in the concentration camps right now. You can go look at them on Google Maps. Uh, they're there. Uh, two hundred thousand. Yeah, and those people are told if we are ever invaded, the first thing we're going to do is kill you all and burn these camps down. They're told this explicitly. So wow. as soon as there's an invasion, that those people have their marching orders. Let's slaughter all these prisoners. Uh, the the entire North Korean government has been waiting for this for decades. So a huge percentage of their infrastructure is literally underground in bunkers. Um, so and of course, as you said, those missiles aimed at Seoul, which is a city with a huge population. You know, it's kind of it's it's like the New York of the of the East. You know, uh, that's also going to be a huge problem. So and let's not forget, China doesn't want 24 million people who have never seen a computer swarming across the border. So, so these what, are, what these, do we do? What the well, hell and do we do? also South Korea. I mean, you know, reunification has been hard for West Germany. I mean, reunification for South Korea, trying to incorporate people who've yeah. been through that experience. One, one, let, let me speak to that. One of the saddest moments of my life, I was doing an interview uh, on TV and I was coming home and I ran to, to South Korean tourists who were in New York for the first time on the subway and I start talking to them and, and they, I, I bring up the book and I, they both said, we don't know anything about North Korea. They don't care. No one cares about these people whatsoever. Uh, and and uh, many of these refugees who go to the South uh, have a hell of a time of it. Again, they've never seen a computer. They're shorter. 
uh, their accent is described as guttural. So they're regarded basically like, you know, in the, in the way the worst stereotypes that some kind of, you know, ultra right winger would have of a Mexican immigrant. Yeah. Like it's like that in, in South Korea. These people have nothing to offer. Uh, they're looked at as trash. The South Korean government puts them on welfare for a year and then good luck. You know, and, and these people who had their lives, every moment of their lives have been they're told what to do. Now that they have independence, they don't really know what to make of it. I mean, there's a story I heard of this refugee woman who had never seen ice cream, and now she's eating it three meals a day, and she's wondering why she's getting fat, because they don't teach them nutrition in North Korea. Yeah. Uh, these are people who wonder how the, someone fits into an ATM, uh, oh, because obviously a little person is in there spitting up money. So if you can imagine living in a cave all your life and then just being dropped into New York... I mean, it's hard for many people to live in New York who grew up in America. Sure. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is what the equivalent of what we're dealing with, and it's really, really, uh, there's no happy ending for the North Korean people, unfortunately. We had uh, Yuni Hong on, who wrote uh, The Birth of Korean Cool. Great book. Um, which is book. a great book, really yeah. fun book. But, you know, one of the things she talked about, she to speak to what you're saying, is apparently there's this show on Korean television now where they have, like, North Korean girls come on and play musical instruments and be charming, but then also tell their devastating stories of what it was like to be in North Korea, all as an attempt to essentially rehumanize these people. Because I think that's the other thing, too, is, and part of what she speaks to in the book is, you know, the South Koreans also went through a different form of brainwashing oh, yeah. in which, you know, the North Koreans were dehumanized. And part of what needs to happen is, is that the South Korean perspective on North Koreans and, the you know, being reminded these people are not only other human beings, they're human beings who are incredibly closely related and often actually related to you. Right. Right. And the other thing is, it's like, you know, if you're like newly well, if you're newly wealthy, like the South Koreans are, mm -hmm. do you really want your cousin from the, from the, you know, back in the Hicks come visit you and, sh and uh, undermine your self image? And that's, you know, it's very dark psychology, but that is how human beings think. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's another unfortunate aspect of this. They don't want to be reminded that, you know, they're one step away from these poor dirt farmers. Mm hmm. It's unbelievable, man. Well, it, uh, yeah. And the, the other thing that I think is interesting, you know, now that I realize what your background is um, as a Jew, no, as a as someone <laughs> as someone who was born in the Soviet Union, I think that's the thing is I I actually visited the Soviet Union when I was six years old or something, and you know, even though I was very young, like it made such a profound impression on me oh, because yeah. we had to sneak. Like, the food was terrible, like, so unbelievably bad. Yeah. And we had to sneak a lot of that food out of our breakfast and basically give it to our tour guide, who was, you know, a charming, wonderful human being and had no food for his family. And, oh, yeah. you know, when you, the, it's those little pieces that you start to realize. And I think this is something that the United States has forgotten because we're far enough from the fall of the Berlin Wall. Like, just how bad communism and just how bad totalitarianism is. And yeah, and, and, and this is happening right now. And, and the thing is, North Korea is segregated based on loyalty to the regime. They have a caste system, uh, which is called Sungbun. And basically, where you live, you're not allowed to travel internally. Where you live is based on what your family was doing in the 50s. So if mm -hmm. your family was loyal to Kim Il-sung, you have a favorable rating. If your family were landowners or Christian, you have a hostile rating. And that, you know, the people with the worst Sungbun were sent to the Northeast. And this determines who gets food. Mm. So literally, your loyalty to regime and your class status determines whether you and your family can eat or not. So this is a whole other level of oppression where, you know, you're consciously being punished uh, based on not, even, not only not your ideology, but the ideology of a grandparent. Well, it's unbearable. You know, the, the, these, I, I, it's funny as you're talking, uh, you know, I realized that over the years I've done a lot of thinking about North Korea. I, I, lived, I grew up all over the world. And, uh, in fact, my area of focus in, in college it was history, but it was Nazi Germany, the Nazi Revolution. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and, and so I've always uh, – and I was just with my, my friend, and I, I have this house in Calabasas, and, uh, and it's sunny, and I got two kids and plenty of food. And, and I, my friend said, this is nice. Look at this view. And I said, yeah, and you know what? I didn't do a goddamn thing to deserve <laughs> this. All the math, for whatever reason, fell in my favor. Right. And, and uh, there are people right now suffering on a level that, it, like you said, you just can't really imagine. When I, and I always go back to this story about a woman in North Korea who stole a ham for her starving children. They arrest her, put her in jail. She never saw her children again. And then she was complaining about her children. And they said, you should have more faith in the state. And they took her out and they shot her. Oh, um, yeah. Well, there's another similar story. 
there's a phenomenal book called Nothing to Envy, which I read in one day because it was so compelling by Barbara Demick. Um, and, and basically, if, you, if someone in your family flees the country, uh, the rest of the family is going to the camps, right? Mm-hmm. So th- this woman's daughter escaped. Uh, so she's like, well, I better get out of Dodge or I'm, I'm, you know, bad things can happen to me. So she bribes the border guards on the Tumen River, the northwest of North Korea, which borders North Korea and China. Now she's wandering the Chinese countryside in a nightgown with literally nothing else to her name. Uh, and she comes across a bowl on the floor with meat and rice in it. And she hasn't even seen meat in years. And she's wondering why the heck is there meat on the floor? And then she hears a dog barking. And that was her moment of realization that the dogs in China eat better than the people in North Korea. I read the same story, and I never forgot it. I read the same story where she realized wow. that dogs eat better than we do. And, yeah, uh, and how can you forget it? And, and, and this is, you know, I, I'm not a social justice warrior by any means, but the, uh, the fact no, that... You're, the, you're a human being. I, I really appreciate your work. I really no, appreciate your compassion, because it's really hard to be on the front lines But also of this. your ingenuity, like to understand, I mean, that's the thing, and so much of this is, you know, to understand human beings well enough to know how to construct the message in a way that we, living in the West, are ready to hear as a first stage. Yeah. Well, this is why, but the point is, I, I, this is what drives me crazy when the press is so focuses, focused on carnivalizing North Korea and mm-hmm. aren't these people wacky and look how crazy. And look, all the women soldiers have the same length of hair and they all march in lockstep. Ha 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 ha. It's like these are 24 million hostages with guns at their heads and the heads of their whole family at all times. And for you to think this is a, some kind of wacky spectacle for you to enjoy, let's pass the popcorn, is such a dereliction of duty for someone who works in the press. It is absolutely beyond me. Can China do more? Oh, yeah, but they don't want to. Yeah, of course not. I mean, that's the yeah. thing. It's a great, but for them, I mean, you know, North Korea is Georgia. It's a buffer zone. Right. Oh, yeah. Originally, Georgia was a buffer between the, the British colonies and the non-British territories in Northern America. And North Korea is a great buffer zone between them and the West. But you would think just from a humanitarian perspective. Yeah, but China, really? Poly- China's humanitarian record? Yeah, well, like, do we really want to talk about that? I know. I know. Yeah, but I mean, but here's the situation with China. China has actually been pressing North Korea in many respects. And under North Korea's uh, Juche idea, which is the ruling philosophy of North Korea, everything has to be by, for, and from the Korean people. So according to them, if something that works for the Chinese, it literally won't work for us because we're Korean. And they revel in the fact that they're this tiny country giving the finger to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So it's a source of great pride that China can be like, hey, guys, let's liberalize. And they go, F you. What are you going to do about it? So they're this scrappy, you know, rabid little dog, uh, which is just killing people left and right. And it, it, what, what, what do you think about this idea? What do you think if we kind of anonymously flew a drone or something over when they were having their big parade and we took out all those old generals and their leader and we were like, we don't know who did it. What do you think would happen? Well, yeah. How well, many people? You'd have, yeah. you'd have complete martial law within five minutes. Yeah. Um, everyone go to your house and do not step outside. We're under attack by the U.S. imperialists. We've been warning you about this for 70 years. They've been biding their time since 1860 when they sent the USS General Sherman to the Taedong River, and we killed them all and sank it to the bottom of the river. So we warned you this day was come was going to come. This proves that the regime knows what we're talking about, and this proves how prescient our great leader is, uh, that he uh, knew this day was long and coming. Well, what if we kill the great leader? Yeah, but well, the great leader's dead, Kim Il Sung, and and the dear leader's dead, Kim uh, Kim Jong Il. So this is the military would absolutely take control in five minutes with the full support of all the people. Wow. Well, this, but I mean, this also we just interviewed. Uh, although actually, I think this is going to release before the interview that we just had. But so. Uh, we we spoke to John Nagle, who wrote the Counterinsurgency Manual, and I think that's the thing is, is that you, Brian, it's a nice idea to think you can annihilate, but you can't annihilate the great leader without thinking about what are the psychological, what are the political ramifications of all of that sort of stuff. And you know, if, assuming that the, I mean, it may be a loss for the great leader, but for the regime and for the apparatus, you take out that bad guy, you justify all sorts of behavior on the behalf of the regime against the people. And this is, an, let, let me use like a metaphor for that Americans will understand. I, I hear a lot of my Republican friends foaming at the mouth and being like, we have to impeach Obama, we have to impeach Obama. Well, it's not like a Republican is going to become president. It's going to be Biden. So, I mean, Kim Jong-il is a, uh, Kim Jong-un is a symptom, um, but he's hardly this kind of like you pull him and Jenga and the whole thing falls on its head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just thought Dennis Rodman was going to change everything. 
everything. And uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, and I guess he dropped the ball. I can't believe that. I mean, and what a great representation of the United States, <laughs> Dennis you know, that, Rodman, ladies that, and gentlemen. That, that piece of crap. He was on Meet the Press, and uh, David Gregory asked, or Stephanopoulos, one of them, asked him about. You know, they have concentration camps there, and Dennis Rodman said, "Well, we have prisons. What's the difference?" As if it's like you know, it's a it's a rhetorical question, yeah. and that's an answer that would take you a day because the difference is between our prisons but and the North Korean concentration camps. Are you camp. suggesting that Dennis Rodman is not a deep thinker <laughs> or well informed? I mean, come on, dude. Now you're drawing. Now you're really stepping over. You've been the bringing line. a lot of crazy this interview. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> a lot of crazy dude. I think you went a little too deep into the character of Kim Jong Il. I mean, you know, I don't know that we can bring you back. Have you, have you gotten any, I don't know, hate mail or any flack from the North Korean government about your awesome book? Well, no, because they don't care about any foreigners. Anything foreign is bad, and 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 the foreigners. And the thing is, the idea that anyone in North Korea would have my book, they would be killed immediately with their whole family. So they they are God. not interested in the outside world whatsoever. In fact, if you're a diplomat from North Korea and you're in another country, uh, your family has to stay behind as hostages to make sure you don't defect. Now, I think also, you know, if you remember, Brian, the conversation we had with Barb Oakley about patriotism. Yes. This is why you should beware patriotism, right? That is, I mean, you know, what the North Koreans have really done is to use patriotism to justify anything they want. Like patriotism is yeah. neither good nor bad. It, it can be used to justify literally anything. And oh, yes. You, right. It's uh, my country right or wrong. That's right. And you can't. And, and, and yeah. by definition, patriotism is unthinking. It's, it's uncritical. It's really, exactly. It's, yeah. And so, you know, the idea that you can control that force and, you know, you may release patriotism for good intentions initially. But, you know, once it gets going because it's unthinking, that cat is out of the bag. And I don't uh, know I, how much you can I'm, control. I'm going to. D- differ a little slightly. It's not just patriotism, it's also racism, because according mm-hmm. to North Korea, the Korean race was all, the only race that's still pure left on Earth. Uh, North Co- Korea was the first government on Earth. It's one of the first languages humans spoke. A Paleolithic man arose in the Korean Peninsula. So all these other countries have been diluted by race mixing, uh, but North Korea is the only pure nation left on Earth. In fact, I have Kim Jong-il in the book make this ironic quote that the leader is nothing like the Fuhrer. They take a lot of their stuff uh, from the Nazis in terms of racial purity. And now the condemnation of South Korea used to be, we're so wealthy, South Korea sucks. Now that South Korea is clearly head and shoulders ahead of them in terms of material wealth, it's that South Korea is race mixing and is a prostitute before American brutes, uh, mm. whereas we keep Koreanness pure and not one drop of ink. And ink is, of course, a very clever metaphor for a dark skin. Uh, shall be uh, dropped in the Han River. So they are the most xenophobic nation on Earth, uh, the most homogenous nation on Earth, and the most racist nation on Earth. They're just huge a holes. And who talks? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know. Yes. Well, uh, listen, know, who, Brian. Who, who, I think this is. I mean, I think you, you couldn't be a bigger. Well, a-hole. but Brian, I think you just <laughs> actually solved the whole North Korean problem because once they hear that. The great Brian Callen has well, deemed them to be huge a holes. Well, They're no, going to do mean, some hard thinking. I want to I be fair. I mean, I do agree with their racial policy, but here's the thing. <laughs> but, 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 but let me just. But if I, I could just. But you haven't considered North Korean point of view. That's true. But let yeah. me, if I could just finish my point, all I'm saying is you may have a point about the ink stuff, but the point is, <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's just an insane problem. You're right. They're just this nasty dog giving everybody the finger, and they're holding us hostage. Hostage. We're and kind holding of a, their own people hostage. Yeah, yes. and I, I just am amazed that there hasn't been some kind of revolution from <clears> within. <throat> but I guess the the power structure, um, it works for them. It works for the elite. Um, but I, I just have to believe that this insanity can't. It just it doesn't have the scaffolding to stand that. I mean, communism, yeah, but that's the communism whole thing. I mean, fell apart in 70 years. But Michael also, I mean, the, the point Michael made, everybody thought they were going to fall apart in 94. You know, they yeah. you starve off a tenth of your population and you still don't lose power. Like, if you want to talk well, is about... There, is there any evidence, Michael, that they are starting to get a little weaker? Yes, and, okay, and this is wonderful. And, and this, is, this is my porn. Whenever I hear that things are not going well for the regime, uh, and I have that little uh, bright light of hope in my heart, it really, really makes my day. 
So one of the things that happened with Kim Jong-il in the 90s in the famine was the government could no longer provide food to people. So what you saw was a rise of these like, like bazaars, these little black markets, where people were selling food you know, for other things. And of course, this is anathema under communism, the idea that you're going to have these small private markets. And every so often, Kim Jong-il would send the guards to kind of shut them down. But the guards weren't getting fed, so they were susceptible to bribes, which is wonderful. Mm. Uh, so now you have these markets are pretty much an established aspect of North Korean culture. And if you're getting your food from a private, you know, old lady vendor on the side of the road, as opposed to the government, you know, human beings are animals. We are going to be loyal to who's feeding us. Mm. And that's certainly going to take away from the mythology of the great provider, the state, uh, and, and lead to this kind of increasing cynicism about why am I, you know, farming in the dirt when I could be living like a poor college student in South Korea and have a car? Well, where and, I, where, you know, whereas no one I know has ever even driven a car. And you're demonstrating the power of the free market. I don't know how much of a concept of the free market there even is in North Korea after oh. 50 years. But Oh, can I tell you that story? Yeah. So this is great. This is how, out of, how removed from reality they are. Toward the end of his life, Kim Jong-il gave everyone in North Korea a 1,000% raise. Uh, or something like 1,000%. Everyone literally got 10 times as much money. Uh, within a month or two, the price, the inflation hit a thousand percent somehow. Yeah, um, what a and surprise! And because of this, he had the finance minister shot for sabotaging his plan. Oh. Wow! Oh. So they're not playing around. It's not like they they read Adam Smith and they're like, well, we're going to try something else. They have no concept of economics, and because there's no North Korean economist, uh, therefore they're not going to read foreign. Li- they're not allowed to read foreign publications. Wow. Uh, they're not even have the beginnings of understanding things like supply and demand, interest rates. Well, what, are their, what are their universities like and, if they have any? They have, probably have one. What, what is it? What is? What do they teach? Kim Il Sung University, which Kim Il Sung University, of course, yeah. named after the, the great leader. Uh, they, they, I mean, they have certain things that they're taught, but when you have like no factories. Uh, they have, uh, you know, a lot of doctors, but they don't have any medicine. They don't have, ex- you know, they have x-ray machines from like the 50s, but no lead aprons. So they they are, are taught uh, at higher levels, you know, certain things. But how you're going to be able to apply it within the system is almost impossible. God. And there's, I mean, there was, uh, there was a great National Geographic documentary where they went in and essentially there's a huge problem with cataracts because of bad yes. diet and all these sorts of things. And so they had to get, I think, aid it was from medical aid from Nepal. And when right. you have to get medical aid from Nepal, <laughs> yeah, then that's... you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. But so the doctor comes in, he brings in some machine and then, you know, and is training these people to, to do these operations. And he goes through an amazing, like hundreds of operations he performs in a the space of a couple of days and then at the end of it all they have this ceremony right where they're going to go and he's going to ex- inspect their eyes one by one to make sure that the surgery worked and that they you know can see and all this sort of stuff and so he takes off the first set of bandages and the first thing the woman does is walk up she doesn't acknowledge the doctor doesn't thank the doctor she walks up to the front of the room and starts crying at in front of the portrait of Kim Jong Il because thank God that Kim Jong-il has restored her eyesight so that she can see the face of the great leader, the beautiful great leader's face. And thank you, thank you. And with every single person, that's what they do. They don't when, acknowledge when, the doctor. I, I'm so glad you brought up the story because this is a great example of how people in the West see North Korea through Western perspectives. Because mm-hmm. this woman was on camera of in course. front of her peers. So it's not like, I mean, possibly she believed it, but the point is, even if she didn't believe it, she sure as heck better put on a show in front of everyone of thanking the right person. Mm-hmm. It's those stories about Stalin when he would come into a room and they would, they would all start clapping in unison, like, bah, oh, yeah. bah, bah, and nobody wanted to be the first guy to stop clapping. Of mm-hmm. course. Right. They, Can you blame him? No, they clap for like an hour and a half. And mm-hmm. it's just, you know, I mean, these horror stories, these yeah, horror everyone, stories. And, and as, as many of your listeners probably are aware, everyone in North Korea has a wall in their home, which is devoted just to a portrait of Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung. And they have to, you know, wipe it down to make sure there's no dust on it. And the glass is angled so that the sun's glare never uh, deflects those portraits. And as well, everyone in the whole country, when they're outside, have to wear a, a badge pinned to their lapel with a portrait of either the, le- the dear leader, the great leader, or both. Not only that, uh, apparently a lot of them used to have piped in speeches. They, they, they had to memorize whatever speech he gave. Oh, yes. Right? 
I mean, of course, and they were tested it at school. You know, this is like, and they analyzed it endlessly, and and so on and so forth. And I think this is a great way, a great method of psychological control. If you're spending all your time analyzing some inane speech to death, you're not going to start questioning the system because obviously this is important for me to learn. God, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it just all reminds me of 1984. It, it is. Oh, yes, it, it's it very, very Orwellian. One of the more sinister moments of my life was when I got my North Korean guy to admit that she loved her big brother. Uh, she did not get the joke, but uh, it's a moment that I cherish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, uh, and how long did you spend in North Korea? Five days. Man. Wow. And wrote the, and the mother just, of all books. Do you, do you, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Would you like to move there? Uh, I, I would like I would like to move as far from there as possible, where, and I where, want everyone who's living there to move away from there. Yeah. Where, where, uh, where do you live? I'm in Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, oh, you are. Okay. Yeah. I, I, and 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 too bad you're not in Atlanta. I'll be at the uh, Atlanta Improv <laughs> October 16th, 17th, and 18th, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, the experience will be the exact opposite of North Korea. It will. It will. I will yeah. be railing against. I'm going to just read Food for everyone. I'm, I'm going to read from the book. I'll start. Yeah. You'll start laughing and you'll end crying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So I, the, 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 a question that I have, like having, you know, been born in the, in the Soviet Union, having thought so much about North Korea, having been there and all that sort of stuff. I mean, obviously, in the United States, a, a large part of what we're trying to figure out is Ronald Reagan. Like, what sure. is your take on Ronald Reagan? I mean, you know, he took a very strong stance against communism. He knew that one billion people were enslaved um, under the Soviet regime. But, you know, I mean, yeah, what 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 do you think of Reagan? Uh, I, I have autographed copies of all of Thatcher's books, if that kind of, and I'm looking at them right now, if that oh, kind mm-hmm. of answers your question. There you go. Uh, uh, but North Korea and Reagan have something very heavily in common, which is peace through strength. The mm-hmm. whole excuse for North Korea's enormous military buildup, they have the fourth largest military in the world, is, uh, as Kim Jong-il said, uh, the peace of the people's preserved on the bayonets of the people's of the revolutionary army. So they agree with Reagan in an inverted sense uh, 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 of peace through strength. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, what drives me crazy about Reagan is if you look at Woodrow Wilson and, and Roosevelt and, and, you know, they had two great defeat, they defeated two, you know, villainous uh, armies and so many people died. And the fact that Reagan and Thatcher won the Cold War without any casualties and somehow they're not on as high a pedestal as these other two just really speaks to how much people who worship the state want blood to feed the machine. Yeah, man. And and you've been critical of Obama. Oh, yeah. uh, I like that sound effect. He goes, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we, what, what, we've what had you... some great sound effects on this podcast. We really need like a soundboard of like. But but I I you know you you're you're a real a real man. You're a real human being. You you take all this time to write about this great tragedy with 24 million people. Uh, what do you think Obama, if anything, could do in his policy toward North Korea? I think progressives don't give a damn about foreign policy. They view it as an inconvenience, and their whole impetus is control internally. Uh, So Obama, you know, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, you would think he would have even the slightest appearance of interest in North Korea. I haven't heard him say anything about it in in, uh, six years now. Uh, So I think it's just absolutely outrageous uh, and reprehensible. And uh, I mean, there's really nothing I can even speak to because he he doesn't care. Yeah. Is it because he doesn't care or he realizes there's nothing he can do? That's, but I mean, Clinton yeah. sent Madeleine Albright. Bush tried the opposite approach of, of being garrulous and putting them on uh, the axis of evil. So both of them tried something. You know, every president uh, up to Obama has engaged with North Korea uh, to he, some he extent. Just, he's just been non-present, which he, he was a great deal well, of his did, senatorial career. I just Googled just to see. Apparently, North Korea called President Obama a wicked black monkey. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're very racist. It's very funny. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and the thing is just, I mean, how so much of the outrage uh, in America is, is, is there when someone internally does something like this. But if a foreign leader, and I think one of the Russian finance ministers called him a monkey also, Jeez. all the social justice wars are suddenly quiet because they don't really know how to deal with other countries. They only know how to deal with, you know, uh, likes on Facebook and Tumblr. That's well, isn't that, isn't that also, <laughs> but isn't that also a consequence of moral relativism? I mean, that's the thing is, you know, the, the criticism that's made of Reagan is, is that Reagan was such a moral absolutist. 
But, you know, when you when you are a moral relativist, it becomes very like you don't have really the 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 emotional clarity I, to. I don't agree. I don't think that that progressives regard North Korea as some kind of exemplar of morality. No. However, the basis of progressivism is anti-racism. So mm-hmm. if you have a nation that's a minority, they're not in a position to criticize it because that kind of causes them cognitive dissonance. As you saw with Ben Affleck losing his crap. Uh, over Bill Maher, because Bill Maher said there are Muslims, you know, who are in favor of terrorism, and uh, that sounds like condemning black people, therefore you shouldn't say it. Mm. But I mean, it's interesting, because I, I mean, you know, maybe I didn't phrase my, my question in the right way, but we, we are sort of at this stage where we're really trying to, you know, we're, we're sort of, I think, collectively, whether you look at North Korea, whether you look at female genital mutilation, whether right. you look at a lot of stuff that's happening around the world, where we're having to come to terms with the fact that there are norms, there are standards, and we really need to be clear on, yes, you know, we can disagree on traditions of dance, on traditions of cuisine, sure. but on certain moral issues. Well, like democracy should be a human right. Yeah. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> I, I, just wrote it, I just wrote an article for The Guardian against democracy. But um, uh, <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, explain well, that, explain, uh, explain that, that to me. I love it. Explain that. Uh, because I, you I, firebrand. Yeah. You firebrand. <laughs> so, sorry about it. Come on. Sorry about it. it. I love you. So the idea that like I can vote for one person, it's a dictatorship, but I can vote two, it's freedom. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, no one can speak for me. If I want someone to represent me, I will hire them. Uh, and I don't understand how if I vote in secret once a year in a booth, that's me quote unquote making my voice heard. Uh, if you want to make change, go write a book. Uh, go help people, go do something. Flicking a switch is how you turn on the light. It's not how you represent your view. I youth. agree. Amen. We could not agree more. That's the whole point of this podcast. Not that we're changing the world, but at least some great ideas are exactly. stuck in books. And, you know, if, and I always say, you want to earn your opinion. It, you have to earn an opinion. You know, political commitment. Most people, we live in a, a society where people think they, they, don't need, they don't need to commit to a philosophical or political point of view. And that is to our own detriment uh, uh, because people suffer. And when the, the wrong ideas gain, gain a foothold, people die. And, yeah. and the way you beat a bad idea is with a better idea. Um, or, with, or, or with humor. Or, or with, with humor, humor or with action or with yeah. action. Yeah. But so, I think, so I think your point is very well taken. That, but I that, think that's that the thing. It's not sense. so much, I mean, uh, you know, it's not so much democracy per se. It's what democracy has become, right? In the minds of most people, most people do think, oh, I just show up every f- two to four years and I vote and that's it. Like I choose from a series of bad options and my right. job is done. But there's, I mean, you know, there's a reason why the First Amendment is first. And that's because... The real work is not what happens on election day. It's what happens on all the other days when you're reading books and you're thinking about these things and you're writing books and you're making funny YouTube videos and whatever else it is to figure out the ideas so that you can then hold your political leaders accountable and say, no, your foreign policy sucks. Here's why. X, Y, Z. I don't believe we need political leaders at all. Uh, I don't think that's that's. And I think if, if you, the the very preface of the, of my book has this great quote from Isabel Patterson that says, "Whenever the word le- the word leader or leadership returns to common parlance, it always uh, uh, affects a, a return to barbarism." I think leadership is just dictatorship by other means, and it's it's just really kind of wacky that you know I can choose eighty kinds of soda. 800 TV channels, and somehow this guy's going to speak for me in terms of taxation and abortion and how I view Russia, because someone in Iowa decided he's going to be who's my president. That doesn't make any sense to me. So what, what would be the alternative to that? Freedom. You're, you're a true libertarian. I'm a true anarchist, yes. Jesus. <laughs> Michael! I'm amazing. Michael! You are, <laughs> Sorry an, about you it. are an outrage, sir, but I know you. <laughs> You bastard! Yeah. I love you. I love you. <laughs> You're outstanding. You you really. I I, I just. So know. wait a minute. So that's the thing. So you've done a lot of ghost writing. Then you essentially wrote, but ghost wrote the biography of Kim Jong Il, right? Autobiography. Yeah. Yeah. Autobiography. So, but what what do you? Is there a book that you are working on that is essentially the extension of this Guardian article that is. You know, I just, I, I mean, I literally just handed the article in a couple of hours ago in the editorial. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not working on, on that at all. Uh, I, I don't care what, honestly, I don't care what people think. My concern right now is I would rather have North Korea be free and they all have the wrong ideas. You know what I mean? That's my, 
My concern is getting people fed, and I, we can worry about ideology and, and voting strategies later, you know. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I think agree. that's so much more important. I, I, I get that from you. I get that from you, and that, that's, that's what endears me to you. That's, that's what's, you know, it's like you, you put yourself last, and that, that's a real act of generosity. Do you think, wh- one of the things that I noticed, we just had somebody who wrote a book uh, 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 called Apart. It was um, about- uh, Justin Guest. Justin Guest, who, who wrote about- um, how many uh, Muslims feel disenfranchised and why in Europe? And by the way, he's he's a Jewish kid from um, from b- b- Los California, Angeles, from yeah. D- yeah, from Los Angeles, from okay. Venice. And w- w- as as a Russian and as a Jew from Russia, um, do you think that your perspective it has been shaped? I don't know how much you identify with your religion, but certainly it's very hard to separate yourself from a tradition of oppression from a tradition of being especially a Russian Jew and do you think that because you come from a group of people who have always been on the outside looking in and so we're never part of the status quo and never really had to answer to strict and rigid cultural uh, norms uh, uh, and we're always able to kind of stand on the outside and say wait this is unfair wait there's a better way to do it that's why I have Nobel Prize well, winners oh, yeah enormously I mean yeah. I went to Yeshiva when I was when I was growing up and one of the things that it taught me is there's no reason that the vast majority of people can believe in things that are completely absurd uh, and, and and I think the basis of you know kind of uh, American and just probably worldwide politics is like if a lot of people think it, it there's probably some truth to it and that's the North Korean approach and there's no truth to the North Korean approach like everyone in North Korea unanimously thinks Kim Il Sung is the greatest person who ever lived I don't agree and then the facts don't bear that out either so just because an idea is popular uh, I think has no validity on its truth well, well, and I think yeah isn't isn't a huge part of the Jewish tradition debate and and being an individual who says wait there's a this is this is wrong or I mean even Moses argued with God for God's sake right well it's also this idea like don't expect uh, people to be able to think critically and to think logically and to kind of be afraid of the mob uh, because that mob might you know kill you and your family just because they don't like interest rates it's true, though. It's it's true. It's the safer higher than ever. Uh, I I worked on D.L. Hughley's book, um, and me and him bonded enormously because you know my dad, when he was in college in Russia, one of his college professors, who was obviously an enlightened, educated man, you know, put my his hand on my dad's shoulder and said, "Ted, you're one of the good ones." Uh, and, and he, I'm sure he meant this in an amiable way, but you have to think about you know, the psychology of someone who would say this with a straight face. You're one of the so, good Jews, in other words. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. So, uh, you know, for D.L., like, I mean, he's obviously, you know, grew up in South Central. He's very anti-racist, but he never thinks we're going to have this society where people are colorblind or not homophobic. You know, I had a dinner party a couple of years ago with a friend of mine, and it, it was a great Brooklyn moment because it turned out every single person at the table was either first or second generation from another country. And mm-hmm. I said, let's go around the table and you tell me who your people hate and why. And of course, someone's wow. like, oh, we don't hate anybody. I go, oh, yeah, who borders you? And I'm like, what do you think about them? They're like, oh, we don't hate them. We just think they're dumb. So <laughs> I, it's such an aspect of human psychology. And that I think people in this country think that that's something that could be you know, thrown away. And it's just baffling to me that they believe this. Well, it's not something that can be thrown away, but you can redefine people's identity, right? In the same way that, you know, there's a redefinition of an identity that happened when you moved from the colonies to the United States. And that's a process that's been going on. Like most people primarily think of themselves as American first rather than in terms of their state. Possible exception, Texas. Um, or New but, York. Or New <laughs> City, York. <certainly. laughs> but, but, but the, you know, there is that redefinition of identity, and I think it is possible for us to think of ourselves in terms of our shared humanity first before we think of ourselves in terms of our nationality or our race or other secondary identities. And that's a large part of, you know, I think in a, in a, in a way what you yourself represent. You see the people of North Korea not as North Koreans, but as human beings, first and well, foremost. I, I don't think I'm the average man on the street, and I don't agree with you that we can teach most people to think of themselves as human beings first. I think most people, all people, are biologically animals, and they're going to have their pack, and they're going to have the people who are not their pack, and those are the bad people, and we're the good people, and that there are plenty of people in our culture, in any culture, who's going to gain power by you know, driving those differences up and, and cashing in on them.
Mm. I agree you're not the average man on the street, but the point is, is that God. you are a human being. And if a human being is capable of that and our humanity, I mean, you're talking about the shared, like our shared humanity means that we can draw these lines between each other, right? So you're saying that there are things that we all have in common. And then therefore, by definition, don't we also have also the capacity? I mean, there's a lot of work that's been done on the fact that empathy can be taught. Is it not possible that we could learn greater empathy? I don't think it's possible for, pe- for the vast majority of people to think and act in terms of principles. So you're I saying that, that you're one of the good ones, but most people can't do that? Yes. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that's the thing, is in a funny way, you've already defined yourself, you know, you're, you're, you're pulling the same thing that happened to your father, aren't you? Well, no. I mean, look, there's been a... Harvey P. Carr, the, art, the comic book writer of American Splendor, wrote a book about me called Ego and Hubris. And the idea that, you know, everyone is basically the same under the skin, I don't think is true. I think most people are very venal. Uh, and I think you see it over and over. I mean, I mean, Lord of the Flies is kind of my answer to this question. I think the veneer of civilization drops very quickly as soon as someone's ego integrity is threatened. Sure, if they, sure. Or if people have to compete over water rights. But, yeah. but by the know, same token, whatever. I mean, that's the point. The, it's, it's not just the veneer of civilization. It's also the level of trust in a society. And I mean... A, you know, a large part of what has happened over human history is, is that as, you know, more and more trust has been built, I mean, you know, do you refute the basic tenet of the better angels of our nature by Steven Pinker? Has the world gotten less violent or not? Oh, I agree that the world's gotten less violent, but that's not because the average man has gotten less violent. I think it's because the average man has less capacity to uh, put his violent nature into motion. But, oh, wow. But do you not that's also... That's interesting. Well, that's true. And I mean, you know, there is the Leviathan, right? The state right. serves to regulate that behavior. But at the same exactly. time, there's also changes in psychology that happen. I mean, you know, what we're, a large part of what happened, you know, across the period of the Holy Wars in Europe is, is that there's a civilization of Christianity that happens where they're no longer pointing to the bloodiest part of the Bible. and they're. Increasing... I don't agree. I think it's just that's what happens when you have separation of church and state. And now it's just, you have the Crusades all over again. It's just in the guise of progressivism republicanism i love michael malice man dude <laughs> I love I, you. you gotta come back you are i i just love this shit i did you are a yeah it's just awesome you've done so much thinking about this stuff and you're just not afraid to voice it um uh, i think you should be gagged and censored there i said it um, but, <laughs> bring it on i'm right but, here what no, you gonna do no exactly he's not afraid michael malice the unauthorized autobiography of kim jong-il if you're a human being if you care about the world if you if you even even care about yourself you'll pick up the book and you'll read it twice it is the mother of all books and michael malice is and a all fight. other books he's, should be burned he's a firebrand <laughs> he, he's he's an anarchist and uh in fact he thinks libertarians are dangerously centrist michael malice <laughs> michael malice you're a beautiful man and, thank you so so much i had a blast dude when i'm come when i come to uh um, I, when I come to New York, uh, I want you front and center. I'm, I, I'm, I'll be doing stand-up. I promise I'll make you laugh. You're a great laugher. I, I, just, I, I know you will. I'm a fan. So can you guys both send me friend requests? I promise. Uh, on Facebook. And, and I'll, I, I look forward to shaking your hand when you're here, both of you. You're the best, dude. You're the best. Thank you. Keep I, doing what you're doing, man. Seriously, you're thank, an important person in the world. Thank you. This, this really, really means a lot, and I appreciate it enormously. And uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm doing this because I care. This, once you see these people in their natural environment, you, you, it, it fucks your head some, for you, something profound. I bet. And it, you're welcome back anytime, man. Anytime you want to talk about anything, I love it. Just you can rant or whatever. It's awesome. Just one more thing. I'm surprised we didn't get to this. You know I did Matt Hughes' book. You, you did? You did who? I'm sorry? Matt Hughes. You did? Yes. I oh did my the first God. MMA book. Wow. Oh, my God. I He's got a, stories for you. Dude, I love it. I, you know, I'm a huge MMA fan, obviously, I as know, you know. That's yeah. why I brought it up. Yeah. Wow. Wow, so you spend a lot of time with that animal. He's a, oh. he's a stud. Talk about strong. Oh, I still hang out with him. Oh, uh, Do you train at all? No, I do. No, no, I do lift. I, I do go to the gym, but it's just to look good. It's, it's uh, no functionality whatsoever. <laughs> I love it. I, I okay. Love- I want to talk to you about Matt Hughes. Um, awesome. Okay. Well, I'm I'm coming to New York, and I'll give you a call. Okay. Love it. Thank you so much, guys. All right. All right thanks best. so much, Michael Bye. Malice. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank uh, you. That was great. That was great. That was so great. Uh, uh, what a colorful dude, man. What a smart guy. <laughs> what a fucking great guy. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, once again, uh, we've solved your problems. Have we? I don't know. I don't know that we really figured out North I hope, Korea. I hope Kim Jong-un is listening. I mean, stop being a dick. Feed your people. Liberalize. You know, anyway. But do you, uh, but do you, do you think that's going to happen? Do you think that Kim Jong-un... I, I, do, think, I do think that... I, I don't believe... 
I do believe that something will crumble from within. I just, I, th- yeah. I think he's young enough. I think he'll be exposed to enough. Um, and uh, I, I just, I well, just, there's also, I mean, there's what Uni Hong talked about in terms of soft power, right? So yeah. the, you've got you've got black markets like Michael's talking about, and then you've also got all of this pop culture yeah. disseminating over the border. Yeah. But so, it, you know, I mean, I, I think hope. that's the thing. I mean, a lot of a lot of a large part of what this whole conversation is about is about human nature. Yeah. Right. And you know, the Soviet Union crumbled from within because of its uh, it didn't fit with human nature. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. I think, you know, it's interesting because Michael is so humanitarian, like he cares yeah. so deeply about people, but also so fundamentally cynical about human nature. Yeah. It's a very interesting mix. Well, listen, man, when you, you know, it's it's uh, it's kind of what I love about the guy. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we got to go. Thank you. Once again, if you like comedy and only if you like laughing and I mean guffawing super hard till your sides hurt you might want to come visit me at the Atlanta Improv (laughs) October 18, 19, 20 and then of course I'll be in Calgary but I always sell out there right away don't you always sell out everywhere? pretty much take a a page out of Kim Jong-il's book you always sell out don't walk everywhere don't walk run (laughs) you've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye.